Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Transgender Show. I'm your host, Emily. My guest tonight is Jasmine Vine. She's a 25-year-old transgender woman from Adelaide, South Australia. Her story is one of great hardship, bullying, domestic violence, serious mental illness, and both parents dying by 21, yet she's overcome it all. Suicidal from age seven, being diagnosed with all sorts of things, including bipolar type one, landing her in the psych ward at 17. She now owns her own company, Javine, where she helps transgender people feminize their voices and helps people recover from trauma and develop an empowered mindset so they can feel more hopeful, confident, comfortable, and safe. Help me welcome the woman who went from suicidal in the psych ward to now a powerhouse inspiration to her thousands of followers and host of the Trans Boss podcast, Jasmine Vine. Hello, thank you for having me on. It's wonderful to have you here. And I apologize for um, for smiling at that last sentence, but um, it is one that Jasmine wrote and it is, it's a very heavy sentence to go through. The woman who went from suicidal in the psych ward to now a powerhouse inspiration to her thousands of followers. What a story. What a turnaround. Let's actually let's actually just jump right into the serious stuff and get there. Um, I was very happy to hear in the pre-show that the trauma that you experienced uh, in, in your early days, because I know you transitioned very early, wasn't directly mm -hmm. related to your your gender transition, not at home at least. Um, can you speak a little mm -hmm. bit about what, what it was that you, you were dealing with there and how your family was yeah. received um, the fact that you were a transgender? Yeah, so as a kid, I never really got any disapproval from my parents or family members about how feminine I was. It wasn't really a discussion. So I would consistently, you know, watching Sailor Moon and pretending that I'm, you know, got beautiful nails and long hair and I'd, you know, use a scarf as, you know, pretend hair or as a skirt and stuff. And my parents didn't blink an eye at it. They were like, that's, that's a kid having fun. And so it was never made wrong. And I think part of that was, um, my family had grown up around my uncle who was a quite effeminate gay man who did drag and um of that kind of stuff and so they'd come to terms with that and kind of just assigned me as the same thing which I wasn't but it allowed them to be more accepting of me so that was good um it was more so at school where the issue was that lack of acceptance hmm on on that bit of your story, the fact that you had this effeminate gay uncle, uh, was there a lot of thought that that had influenced you and influenced your identity among among your you know your family members? Was that something that was brought up? I'm not sure entirely. My like when I came out as trans initially, my mum thought that I was coming out as a feminine gay person is, which, I mean, she's right, <laughs> but um, not in the way she thought. So it did kind of paint the picture of how they viewed me, but I don't think it really changed how I viewed myself at all. I always felt quite distinct um, from my uncle and what he was doing, but um. There definitely was one time where uh, he put me in like drag makeup because I was really interested in watching uh, Drag Race at the time and I was like, oh, I really like, you know, the makeup and stuff. And he was like, I can, I can do that if you, <laughs> if you want to. And that was like really good for me at that time because I, so much gender euphoria it's just absolutely brilliant. Hmm. So part of that helped me to come to terms with myself more, I think. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's nice. It's nice to have that 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 ally in your family, even though hmm. yeah, you didn't experience a lot of rejection within your family. So I think that that's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, 
Mm. I think we'll we'll jump tracks just slightly. I don't want to jump right into the the bullying. Um, I kind of want to lighten it up for mm. for for the beginning here. Um, so let's jump over to my favorite question to start with. How did you choose your name? Oh, I've changed my name a whole bunch of times since beginning. I initially I changed my name to something that I thought was easier for people to get a hold of um so my name was Izzy at the time because that was closer to my um dead name and that was nice for a little while there's still some people that call me that <laughs> on like YouTube from back in the day um but I went through a few iterations there I knew that that wasn't where I wanted to land and I started playing around with some things like Zakaria, which again was closer to my dead name, and playing around with things like that. But none of that really felt right to me. Um, and so what I ended up doing is I've actually got it in my jaw here. I got a, a notepad and I wrote down a bunch of names that I liked based on different things. I was watching Orange is the New Black at some point and I was like, Alex is really nice. I thought that you know, Alexandra or um, something along those lines. And I basically just wrote all of the names down that I liked. And then I gave it to my mum and her partner at the time. And they sat down and went through all of the names and wrote commentary, which probably won't be able to see very well, but they wrote commentary on all of these names. <laughs> Um, it's like Alexandria, Alexandra. I don't know if I can swear on this. <laughs> um, but they oh, put oh, the yeah. B word. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. What, whatever so language put, you um, need to to express what's going on for you is is fine. And if it's somebody beautiful. else's words of expression, then that's even that's even better. <laughs> beautiful. Um, because yeah, they basically just commenta uh, commentated. They said this one, nah, sounds like a bitch. This one sounds like a tart. I'm like, what? <laughs> Um, this one doesn't sound like a name. I was trying to play around with some interesting sounding names. And one that I chose was, um, Angela backwards. Cause I thought Allegna sounded cool. But, so yeah, I played with a whole bunch of them and the one that was starred was actually Jasmine. Huh. Um, as well as a couple of others like Xanthia. Kira, um, all of those I really liked, Jade, Opal. Um, but yeah, I ended up going with Jasmine partly because I wanted a name that was clearly feminine, that wasn't um, one or the other. Mm. And I think at that time for me, it was, it was insecurity choosing to do that but it's ended up working quite nicely i quite like the name now it really fits me and yeah it's it's really stuck <laughs> well i really like when people are able to involve their parents uh, in some way in the name mm. choice and and you know give them a little bit of, of power for it. it it you know brings them yeah. into the process and can ease some of the the transition pains there for them so i do like that mm. i did want to say Allegna, I don't like the the gn sound so much but i think if you if you did a like a french pronunciation on it alenya could have been pretty, oh. pretty darn good alenya don't mind that <laughs> Who knows? Maybe this time next year, Jasmine will be gone and <laughs> <laughs> not again. Oh not my again. gosh. Yeah, you're too established now. Too many rebrands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, yeah. Renaming is is much easier to do than rebranding. That that's a tough one. So yeah, you're you're locked mm. in. You're locked in. In saying that though, the name, because my last name is Vine, Jasmine Vine is also a plant. Mm -hmm. And so now when Enna Whenever anyone tries to search me online, they get plants. It was an unintended consequence of choosing this name. Completely hey. can confirm. I did experience that today. <laughs> oh, gosh. There you go. 
So um, when you you transitioned very early, when did you start uh, that whole process? Um, let's see. Well, usually what I like to do is is start at the end um, and work back. And I think probably in your story, that's even that's mm -hmm. that's going to be a, a good way to go as well. So when did you realize that you were transgender? That that was the term that fit you, and that you needed to start you know presenting differently and and making mm. some changes. So what's interesting for me is I didn't come to the understanding that I was trans before social transition, which is kind of strange. But I, it was a situation of looking at how do I prefer to present? Uh, what do I prefer to put out there? Do I prefer to have long hair or short hair? I knew I'd prefer to have long hair. Do I prefer these kind of clothes or those kinds of clothes? And it was an exploration process for me over time. And initially I came out as a gay male and I was very effeminate like from that point on. I would wear a full face of makeup. I would wear, you know, feminine clothes. And over time, because I was growing my hair out and because I was getting better at makeup and I was, you know, wearing more and more thick feminine clothes, I started um, getting to the point where from behind, someone would come to me and be like, hey, miss. And it was really affirming to, to hear that. And that was like some of the first times where I was like, oh, I'm starting to be mistaken for a woman, I'm starting to get she, her pronouns used for me. And it felt really nice. I was like, I'm okay with that. And it kind of just cascaded from there to the point that I had practically socially transitioned before coming to terms with the fact that I was trans. <laughs> just, yeah, kind of strange. I, you know, we were talking before about the acceptance from family, and I actually think that that has played a part in that whole process of transition for me because I had a broader perspective on what is feminine, what is masculine, and it was a little bit more mishmashed for me than I guess other people at school would say. So part of that whole process was like, oh, guys can have long hair. That's that's no problem. Guys can wear makeup. Sure, guys can wear more feminine clothes. Guys can do this. Guys can do that. And it cascaded to the point that I was like, huh, well, maybe I'm just not a guy <laughs> if, I, if I want all of those things. Which is, yeah. That acceptance um, and that broader perspective, I think, really played a part in that for me. Whereas if I was scolded and like, no, boys don't do that, I think it may have played out a bit differently. There might have been more shame around it. Hmm. Hmm. So how old were you when, when you went through this process? Social transition around about 14 is when I really started getting into that. And it started out as I was presenting more femme on like the weekends and for places like outside of school at the time. Um, I had a wig that I would wear and, um, you know, more feminine clothes. So I was kind of living as myself part time. And I found that I just wanted to live as that version of me more and more and more and more. <laughs> And so then I started wearing the wig to school and then I started, you know, wearing more feminine sort of stuff to school. So, yeah, it was definitely from 14 by 15 and a half, 16, I was living as myself full time. And when did you yeah. start experiencing the, um, the bullying or at least the kind of the, the more severe bullying? One of my earliest memories is being in kindergarten and we were all painting on these little easels and all of the boys in the class were painting cars and, you know, things like that. And I painted a 
little pot with a pink flower <laughs> and someone called me a faggot <laughs> from that. I was like, whoa, I didn't even know what it meant. And it kind of didn't slow down from that point. <laughs> oh. mm. So right from right from the start, yeah. you were you were different than other than than boys and um, you were called out for it. Pretty much. I was always a lot more feminine than any of the boys around me. And it wasn't until like when I came out as a gay guy and I started being more effeminate in my expression, that was probably the most reprieve I had because prior to that, it was like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And I was, you know, denying it all. And after I came out that first step it didn't affect me as much because i was like yeah of course i am absolutely i'm very feminine of course took a and lot so of took, took a lot of the bite out of their punch. yeah took a lot of bite yeah. out of their slurs basically yeah 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 100 so that was a big help um and then it started again with um when i started identifying as a woman and then the bullying was more around like, oh, you'll never be a woman, you know, blah, 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 blah. You'll always be a man, all that kind of stuff. Um, so then some of the bite came back in because it was another sore spot. <laughs> mm -hmm. And was that, was, was, were people doing that to your face? Was that happening in school? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Amazing that people would be uh, brave yeah, enough to actually do it in that. person. You know, usually it's it's online with, uh, mm -hmm. with the, uh, the comments, hiding, people hiding behind their keyboards. So. Lots of just, online. Mm -hmm. lots of online stuff because I was active on YouTube at the time as well. And in school, though, there were a few instances where... So there was an instance where somebody started throwing uh, pieces of wood at me, like chunky pieces of wood. Um, and that happened a couple of times. Uh, you know, there was one time on a playground where there was like a group of people throwing stones and like bark and wood at me and there was another time that that happened in school and I was brought to the principal's office at that time and like explain the situation what happened and I was like well it was because they don't see me as who I am and um all of this and the principal at the time actually because she asked, you know, is there anything we can do to support you to make this better? I'm pretty sure that kid got expelled from the school. So there was some level of support there. However, when I said what would help me, which was, hey, can I wear the, the women's school uniform? Um, because I felt that that would help me blend in more. Um, she said no. And said that that's going to make me stick out like a sore thumb, apparently. And I ended up just completely disregarding the, the school code. And I started wearing jeans instead, which still stood out because everyone was in uniform. But wearing the male school uniform is actually what made me stand out. <laughs> that was a, yeah, a bit of a shitty experience. She later denied that she ever said that. Like, yeah, it was a weird situation. But that bullying was pretty prominent all throughout until I dropped out at like 17 oh, or 16. Okay. Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was that was that the end of your school experience or did you um, end up going back at some point? No, that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. I decided that my mental health was much more important than any conventional education. And I am, I don't regret that at all. That was what I needed to do at the times, what I felt was right for my mental health at the time. Um, cause I was dealing with a lot there and the, you know, the suicidality was really prominent throughout that time as well. And it was really exacerbated through all of the bullying. And so, yeah, I was like, it's, it's not worth it. I do not care. Like that's, that's the end of it, essentially. Mm -hmm. mm. And then I know that it's about this time where um, you be 
was it because of the suicidality and and what you were going through there with the mental health that you ended up um being um held in a psych ward as you call it yeah so that was um so i dropped out at 16 and after that point i did go down a little bit of a spiral i was in a a relationship that was emotionally mentally abusive thankfully not physically um but that was a thing i was addicted to marijuana and i really had nothing going for me in life i just kind of felt like i was recovering from all of the experiences and i was active on youtube at the time which is what really helped me hold on because i was sharing my experience and what i was going through i was sharing my hrt journey and month one update month two update and all of that and i could see from the comments that that was helping people and people were coming to terms with their identity and relating to my experiences and everything and that was fuel for me during those times to stay around <laughs> um which i'm very very thankful to if anyone's watching this who was around back in those days who shared that kindness and that compassion that was so so pivotal for me um but yeah essentially it was it was a bit of a spiral that i went into and I ended up in like a manic episode, um, which I was quite well aware of because my mum had quite severe bipolar throughout my childhood. So I had seen how it affected her. I kind of knew the signs and symptoms. And so when I experienced it, it was a shock, but it was like, oh, I kind of, I know what's going on here, um, which was a good um, thing to be able to latch onto there. But from there i really needed help i was absolutely just not doing well and going to the psych ward was really helpful for me although there were certainly some experiences in there as well where like one of the psychiatrists oh gosh what was the wording my mum was really upset about it i remember because in a meeting with her they essentially called me a delusional boy or like something or other. Um, and he was basically viewing being transgender as the issue. Like that's why I was in the psych ward. Um, and that was the first, one of the first experiences I had when I was actually in the psych ward was this psychiatrist saying to me, oh, so you're in here because you're, because you're delusional, you're a delusional boy like what wow. um yeah yeah there are a few things like that in there where it was just not a great experience however it was also a pivotal point in time where it was essentially okay jasmine you've got to cut the crap like i'm waking up every day smoking freaking like a train with marijuana and all of that i'm never even thought about having a job I was just going absolutely nowhere with my life and it was not helping my mental health at all and it was this breaking point for me where I was like I've got to change something I've got to start doing something differently now um and that was it was a good push for me actually to have that as traumatic as it was <laughs> it was a it was a good push for me Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it it's it's a terrible thing about being trans that sometimes we have to go through some some pretty intense trauma to get through to mm -hmm. the other side you know um there's mm -hmm. there's the internal struggle like like i went through of, of denying that i was trans and, and fighting against it completely there were the um, mm -hmm. external factors that that you run up against especially when you when you come up to the people that are the ones that are supposed to be taking care of you are supposed to be be your guys and your wards and um 
sort of gaslighting you, the 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 um, the mm. the principal at your school, um, and then this this psychiatrist that just misses the mark entirely. Um, how how much did that that one psychiatrist set back your healing and your ability to actually make good progress there? Hmm. I don't feel like it set me back much at all, to be honest. Like it was a distressing experience at the time, but it was something I felt like I was able to brush off quite easily. And because I had my mum's support with that as well, and she was, you know, helping me kind of come to terms with that and saying, you know, he doesn't know what he's freaking talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's the thing as well. He sexualized me in one of the meetings and said, maybe we can prescribe a, a sex toy or something. It was some ridiculous thing that was just so, um, yeah, so, so out of whack. But I think it was ridiculous enough for me to go, there, there's, a, there's a clown. I've, I put no stock in his opinion. <laughs> so yeah i did i was able to not let that affect me much so it sounds like a lot of your recovery process then was sort of on your own shoulders you you you, you took it on on yourself mm. to um you, you took it on yourself to to um seek out the psychiatric ward that you went into correct i did okay yes and then yeah. And then it sounded like you, you you came to your realizations while you were there. Once you were able to kind of clear your head, um, what were your what were your next steps? Then how did you start moving towards where you are now? One of the I've probably got it in a folder somewhere actually, but it was the first time where, like post transition, I'd actually sat down to set some goals. And it was simple, simple things. It was like, where is my life at at the moment? Well, there's this, this, and this going on. How much is that helping me? It's not. It's not helping at all. And so I started to set some routines for myself as the first thing. And it was simple things like going for a walk. And it was um, staying connected with friends, staying connected in like the Trans Boss Network, which was really helpful for me at the time. And just starting little by little to build in those routines was really helpful for me to start shifting that mindset. And also just looking after myself, developing a sleep routine, developing like a better eating routine because I would go days without eating. I would stay up all night and like sleep whenever. Um, and so developing a lot of those things was the foundation for me to start building on top of that. Um, I'm trying to think from that point, there was a lot of changes that had to happen in my life. Um, you know, that relationship, uh, come to an end. So I moved out of there. Um, I fell into a traineeship, which they had to, they were paid to take me on as a trainee. <laughs> and it was something I was really skeptical of at the time. Um, because I didn't think I had any worth. I didn't think I was good enough to do anything. I thought I was just this loser who was destined to be unhappy and not achieve anything with my life. That was my mindset at that time. And little by little, I started showing myself evidence that that wasn't true. And really simple things like celebrating them. When I went into that traineeship, like I said I was very skeptical but it was the first time I was around people that had jobs and who were at, at that time I viewed to be as relatively normal people. <laughs> and it started to show me a different way of relating to myself and relating to other people and viewing my worth as well, seeing that I could contribute to society in a meaningful way was all of these little things like really started building up my confidence in myself and it just compounded. I started getting into reading self-development books or like, you know, self-healing type things like 
you know, the happiness trap here is one that was really helpful for me. Mm. Um, and I started learning about the languaging that I was using and how I was viewing myself as a victim and like all of these little things. And it just compounded. It kept going. It kept compounding. And yeah, it's it's hard to put that into like a, a summarized version, actually, because there was so much that went into that. Um, 11, you know, 12 years of therapy somewhere along the line there as well. <laughs> um, therapy does help. Therapy does help a lot. <laughs> mm, yeah. I started seeing therapists after my dad died when I was 11. Um, so from then, pretty well consistently throughout my life, I've been seeing you know, various therapists. One thing I want to mention as well is I went through about nine different therapists before I found one that really clicked. And that was a thing that I saw a lot of people around me kind of gave up on therapy because they went and saw one person and that person was transphobic or the person didn't have a clue about anything diversity related. And so it just put them off. Um, but I found, you know, for myself, that was something I had to have a bit of persistence in and continuously try different therapists until I found one that clicked. So yeah, it was definitely, it was a big journey. It's a big journey. Mm -hmm. and well, and I love the message of, of how simple the start was. You're setting yourself some routines oh, yeah. and it wasn't, you know, accomplish all these things or whatever. It was, you know, go for a mm -hmm. walk, try and eat a little bit better. Um, you know, set a good sleep schedule. I think that is, that's really important to remember. And we talked a little bit about something similar, you know, the trap that we get into mm -hmm. in looking at social media and, and seeing other people, what they're achieving, how they look, all of, all of those sort of things in their transition. And we mm -hmm. like to judge ourselves against that. And I think there's this, there's this tendency to look at people who are successful and go like, oh, they've got all these great things and they're, and they're you know, if, if they're setting goals for themselves, there's these big lofty yeah. goals. But the important thing to remember is how simple it is to get started, to change that momentum in the right direction. And definitely some advice that I, I, I need to remember to take myself because, yeah, I've, I've, I, I, I do that a lot too. I look too too far towards the big picture and instead of focusing on the mm. little things that will just improve my life on a day-to-day -day basis and make those things easier so thank you for that yeah yeah all good that's what? really really important is um because that was another thing that i just remembered i would write to-do lists for the day that were super simple like brush my teeth um eat something drink some water and Sometimes when you're really, really in the depths of that, you know, struggle in that mental health struggle, doing that is just the tiny little bit of dopamine hit that you get for ticking something off. And it doesn't need to be big. It doesn't need to be a big lofty goal. It can just be the tiniest little thing that helps you just build towards the life that you're wanting. So yeah, super, super important that one. I love it. Mm -hmm. Let's let's dive into something that I like to get into um, to really kind of figure out what what this whole experience means to people. What do you feel that that this gender exploration, that this journey that you've been on, has meant to you on an ethereal level? What what does what does transition mean for you? Well, on an ethereal level, <laughs> um. I honestly view it as a gift a lot of the time. I haven't always. It's been something that I've been like, oh, I wish I was born cis, everything would be so much easier and this, that and the other. And I think two, can, two things can be true at once. Like, yes, it would have been easier. However, I wouldn't have had the experiences that I have had. And that would actually make me a person who is much less aware, who has a much narrower perspective. And transition for me, building that perspective and seeing how the, 
the nastier parts of the world, the nastier parts of you know reality as a trans person sometimes has actually made me a more compassionate person and a more caring and kind person. Because now I don't have that sort of harsh judgment of other people as much. Like I still do, I'm a human, but I can show a lot more compassion and kindness to people. And I don't think I would have been able to do that without the experience of transition. And to me, I think that's a really, really beautiful thing. One thing I like to ask, and I love to cover in this because, you know, there, again, going back to that example that a lot of people um, see on social media of this sort of perfect life and, and everything's mm. great, is to talk about dysphoria and sort of the, the, the fact that it's something that we all face throughout our journey and even even long into it. Um, what, what forms of dysphoria do you st still kind of struggle with if you do? Yeah. Hmm. Initially on my journey, there was a lot of physical dysphoria. However, I think it was physical dysphoria masquerading as social dysphoria. So, you know, I was really preoccupied with the squareness of my chin and how wide my hairline was and, you know, my brow bone and like bump in my nose. And I would pick apart every freaking part of myself. And it was mostly, um, the reason I say I think it's mostly social is because I didn't have much dysphoria in relation to my body. I didn't like body hair. I wanted that to be less. Um, it's like that was a thing for me. But I didn't necessarily have massive top dysphoria or bottom dysphoria. That wasn't so much a thing for me. It was more so about the roles that I fit into and feeling excluded from like female spaces or, you know, feminine gender spaces that was really more of the struggle for me. Um, and I thought it was, I thought it was all physical. I thought, oh, if I get all of these surgeries and stuff, then I'll be fine. I'll be happy. Yada, yada. But it actually wasn't about that. It was about my lack of acceptance of myself and worrying about other people's opinions of me that I think was the big part. And so socially, people, um, you know, using the wrong pronouns for me or dead naming me or um, like all of that kind of stuff where they'll look at me funny if I'm going into a, you know, women's restroom or all of that kind of stuff was where I felt most of my dysphoria. Um, nowadays, I wouldn't say I experience a lot of dysphoria nowadays. I think it's a lot less. I have a lot of acceptance for myself. I um, still have things about myself that I'm like, mm, it'd be nice if that wasn't there, but it doesn't bother me. It doesn't make me question myself. It doesn't make me question my validity in any way. It's not a hurtful thing to me at all now, but where there still is a little bit, I think, is um, social expectations because, and this is something that I, I talk about fairly openly um, sometimes, is I haven't had any surgeries. I don't plan on having any surgeries. And standing up to go to the bathroom is something that I do every freaking day. <laughs> that is not something I feel, you know, weird about in any way because I have a body, my body has the parts that it has, and my gender is the gender that it is. Like, that is just who I am. And so from my perspective, why do I need to fit into gender roles and act as though I have a body that I don't? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't sit with me and neither do I. <laughs> it's a horrible joke there, but, um, but when I think about socially, particularly people that I care about their opinions, that's where that little bit of self-doubt creeps in as well. Like, oh, what will they think of me if that? And it was something literally just like a couple of hours ago 
um, that popped into my mind for whatever reason when I was in the bathroom um, was like, would I be okay with this if my partner was like able to see me or would I feel weird about that? And I think I would feel weird, but is that dysphoria or is that just because it's weird for someone to watch you pee? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure where, where, where that falls completely. I know it, it is, it is a little weird to <laughs> watch your partner pee. And yet, um, the amount of times it happens in this house, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I've, I've gotten way over it. Um, that's that's really beautiful to hear that you you don't struggle with much dysphoria because you know that 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 can be a heck of a stumbling block for us sometimes and and can you know set us into into those spirals you transition very early i don't assume that you have a lot of struggle um blending in as as a woman uh, and being seen as a woman in society i i really appreciate the fact that you have taken the steps to remain a very public trans woman you're, you're very public mm -hmm. as a trans person what has been the main drive for that in staying so public instead of you know trying to blend in more often i've gone both ways with it when i was early in transition i was very public about it i shared my journey online like youtube and all of that and it was a very big part of my identity and how i related to the world once i went into that um traineeship i basically went into it in stealth so no one in the workplace knew that i was trans and that went on for a couple of years and i dropped off the face of the earth like on social media and everything i really kept to myself and i used the i'm going to call it an excuse because it was for me i used the excuse that I am just like any other woman and so I should just, you know, exist as myself and, you know, be comfortable in the world and all of that. And yes, I agree, like with that younger version of myself, but I, it was actually internalized transphobia in disguise. I thought that that was the best thing for me and that I could just exist and be happy and all of that. However, not being open about my trans identity was almost like it was a wall that was in front of me and other people because even little things like someone at work would ask me do I have a tampon and I would be like oh no no sorry I don't have any and it was almost like this little level of shame came up in each of those things because I felt like I wanted to be open and I wanted to connect with people and be open about all my experiences. And it caused me to not be able to connect with people on a deep level. So for me, re-coming out again was really important for me. And I started, you know, I came out in the workplace, I joined the diversity and inclusion um, panel I came out in like the first meeting that I was in there and to the point that like everyone around me knew that I was trans in the workplace and I just felt so much more comfortable because it, there was a little part of me that didn't fully accept myself and because of that hiding my trans identity it felt like others didn't accept me as well which was, yeah, really. So I, I really went full out with it. I started getting back online. I started posting about um, my experiences again. When someone asked me, you know, for a tampon, I would say, yeah, I don't really have much use for that without a womb. I'd make a joke of it. <laughs> like, um, and it was so much lighter for me. It felt so much more comfortable. It's <sighs> really interesting. You'd think living as a stealth trans woman would be more comfortable. And I will say in a lot of ways it was. However, that connection piece was so, so important to me. And it was the big thing that was cut off. 
And I don't know if that would be the same for others. I, there are a bunch of trans people that just want to live their freaking lives. They're like, I want to live on a self-sustaining farm. I want none of no one's bullshit. And I'm just going to be myself and all of that. And I really respect that as well. And I think that that's important that people, you know, they should be able to have that as an option for themselves. And on one hand, I'm grateful that I kind of have that option for myself. But living both of those, I would choose being openly trans, thousand percent. <laughs> Is there anything in your life that you feel like you've been able to accomplish because of the fact that you're trans? Oh my goodness, my whole business. <laughs> As you can see, it's very trans. Um, colors and everything. Um, a lot of the mindset work that I do nowadays is because I'm trans. It's because I've experienced all of those things and the bullying and all of the stuff that came along with that. And it's enabled me to be able to relate to other trans people and to share an experience that they may not have been able to connect with someone on prior to that. I remember something in particular, I was a um, suicide crisis supporter for a couple of years and there was a trans person on the end of that line who was talking about her experiences and the struggles that she was having at that time and it was something I really related to. I was like, oh my goodness, this, this girl's me. And um, yeah, there was the point there where she went, you know what, you probably don't understand what I'm saying anyway, and just hung up. And she was in a very vulnerable state. She was in a very like, you know, she was calling a suicide crisis support line. And that just absolutely freaking broke my heart to have that experience. And it reminded me of what power there is in our stories and what power there is in being able to openly and vulnerably share your experience with other people because other people can connect to it and not feel so alone and feel like someone gets them, someone gets what they're going through. And if I was born cis, I would not be able to connect with trans people in the way that I do. I wouldn't be able to help people the way that I do. I wouldn't be able to understand their perspectives the way that I do. And for me, that is a very unique gift. And it's one that when I was stealth, I wasn't able to use it. And now that I'm out as myself vulnerably and openly, I can use that to its fullest potential, <laughs> essentially. And that is what I do now. Like literally everything I do in the mindset work, in the voice work, it's all helping that younger version of me not feel so alone. It's almost like, it's almost like inner child, like healing work <laughs> to be able to help other people through it. What is your favorite thing that you have learned through this experience, either about yourself or the world around you? Oh. I've learned a lot about bigotry and hatred and where that comes from and people's perspectives, how they develop those perspectives, because I've had to um, dissociate a lot of it from myself. I've had to learn how to brush off certain types of comments and certain types of perspectives and everything. And throughout that process, I, and, and this is probably partly autism as well, actually, is like, how do people relate? How do they, how do they talk? How do they think? And that's something that I was able to dive really deep into. I think because of that journey, is I got this big drive to understand how people develop perspectives, how people develop opinions, beliefs, and attitudes, and where that all comes from. And that's helped me be a much more compassionate and kind person to people. And it's helped me to brush off hate comments a lot easier and to feel more self-confident and, you know, secure in myself. So that for me is a really big learning. And it's one that 
I I yell about it from the rooftops all the time. Like, look at other people's perspectives. Look at where could this possibly have come from? What could their upbringing have possibly have been? You know, what propaganda might they have been exposed to? What's important to them in life? And that's almost been like a special interest for me is diving into how all of that works. And so now I can use that knowledge and that experience to one, not let things affect me as much, and two, show compassion for people, even if they're throwing shit in my face. And how has that mm -hmm. helped you, you, do you feel, um, in communicating with them and, and sort of swaying hearts and minds? Or does it just help you to deal with what, you're, what you, is coming at you? It has helped on so many levels with that. This is something that I get a lot of, um, I get a lot of pushback when I share this um, this perspective, but I'm very openly passionate about being kind and compassionate to haters, people that are expressing hateful views, because there is so many more layers to it than people usually understand. And this could be a whole freaking hour in and of itself, like how we process information as humans, how we delete, distort, and generalize information, what sort of biases we have. But essentially, I've dived into understanding all of those things and understanding how the unconscious mind works and all of that. Because when someone throws a hate comment at me, I like to say I'm not reacting to it, I'm responding to it. If I feel myself go into an elevated state, if my heart rate increases, if I start to feel defensive or I start feeling the need to justify or make excuses, I will step back and go, okay, I'm feeling activated at the moment. I'm feeling triggered at the moment. So I'm going to step back, do a little bit of meditation, draw my mind to something else because sometimes comments do affect me. That is very rarely. That's like if I'm in like a rundown state, if I'm really tired, if I'm like, you know, <laughs> just like sick of people's bullshit today, that might be one of those times where I have to step back. However, nowadays, because I've practiced this so much, my response to the comment is to show kindness and compassion to them as much as I can. Anything that I could freaking latch onto, I will. So if I make a post about, you know, the age that I transitioned, or if I make a post supporting gender affirming care for people under 18, you know, things like that, there'll often be a lot of backlash towards those things. And for me, I like to think about what values does this person have? What does this person care about? What does this person, what have they been exposed to? What's What's been their life story? And most of the time, what you'll find is you don't know any of those freaking things. And so for me, I feel like I don't actually have enough information to judge this person. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know their perspective. And sometimes it's a really simple thing. Well, they'll say, I don't think kids should have access to this and mutilating the bodies and yada, yada, yada. And I'll just respond saying, hey, um, thanks for your comment. I can see, you know, from your profile picture that you've got a little kid, you must really care about them. Sometimes that is literally where I'll leave that. I'll just leave it there. And what I find in those interactions is they'll come back again and be like, blah, 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 blah. yeah, but you, trans people don't exist. Or blah, 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 with all of the freaking things that they can throw. And I'll just respond compassionately each time. And it takes the wind out of their sails. They go, wait, what? Why is this person not clapping back? And there was one in particular, actually, that was commenting a lot of hateful things on my post. And I said to them, hey, um, you know, I'm sure there's some other things that you care about in your life. And I really want you to think about the impact that you're having on the people around you, on the world around you. And the impact that you're having with these types of comments is quite a negative one. It's making people feel this way, this way, and this way. And I know that you're probably a good person. You don't want people to feel that way. And so I'd encourage you to redirect that energy into something you're passionate about, something that lights you up, something that helps you do something nice in the world or nice for yourself. And this person commented back like, whoa, okay, I didn't expect that. And they actually said, you know what, you're right. This isn't the kind of person that I want to be. 
I actually want to be a kinder person and a more thoughtful person. And they left the comment section. I don't know what they're doing with their life now, but to me, that is, for me, it's such an effective way of handling those types of things because the worst case scenario is they don't listen and they go off in their tirade and then I block them. That's like worst case scenario. Best case scenario, they go, holy shit, what am I doing with my life? Maybe I do want to have a better impact in the world. And then they go and do that. Win-win <laughs> in my view. I know. Can you say another, oh, another little bit on that mm -hmm. because that's it's such a big topic. But when someone is reacting really negatively and they're throwing hate comments and all of that, they're in a dysregulated state. Like their stress response is on board. When that happens, it literally shuts off people's prefrontal cortex. They do not have the logic and reasoning available to them that they normally would. And so a lot of people, when they're in those interactions, is they'll bring up the facts. And I used to do this all the freaking time. Or like, you don't know what you're talking about. Look at this article. This per this says this. And look at all the citations on this and blah, blah, blah. And what I didn't realize at the time is they're not actually in a space to receive that information. All it's doing is bringing up their defenses and they want to fight against their thing because the unconscious mind always wants to be right. And it has a desire to stabilize our identity and to stabilize our belief. So if we have a certain belief and someone fights against that belief, the natural inclination is defense. I have to defend this because partly it's defending their identity. But here's the thing. When you listen to and validate someone's perspective, you go, hey, yeah, that must be really hard for you to see young trans people, you know, transitioning socially. I can see you have a kid. That must be really scary for you. And you must be you know, concerned about how that might affect your kid seeing those things. You know, I really feel for you. You sound like a really good parent. <laughs> like, whoa. They don't usually get that experience. And when you consistently do that, what happens is they move out of a dysregulated state and they move into more of a parasympathetic um, you know, nervous system, which is where they're calm. They're, their logic and reasoning comes back online. And what will happen half the time, not all the time, half the time they'll come to you and go, hey, you actually really listened to me and heard me out. I'm curious to know your perspective now. And that is so freaking powerful. When someone gets to that state, they feel heard and listened to. The law of reciprocity kicks in. When you're nice and kind to someone else and they feel validated and everything by you, the law of reciprocity kicks in and they actually feel a social obligation to return the favor. Not all the time. But hey, we can use psychological know-how in order to actually interact with these people to actually create change and actually create changed perspectives this is something i'm really passionate about as you can probably tell <laughs> so as as we close up here and i know there's I, this is another topic that's going to have a thousand possible answers but what are some of the oh. key pieces of advice that you have to pass on to younger closeted trans folks out there i mean it's along the same lines as what we were talking about just then it's understand that other people's opinions of you other people's perspectives are theirs that belongs to them and whether they try to project that onto you or not does not make it yours and so learning to love and accept yourself as you are and really internalizing that will help shield against any of that stuff that is not helpful for you and it's easier said than done there's a lot of you know, difficult experiences that you'll probably have to go through as a young trans person or a closeted trans person. And just know that you can get to the other side of that and you can use your experiences as a way to inspire other people rather than to push you down. Jasmine Vine, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wonderful perspective and this great bit of advice. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on.